Hi everyone, I'm so happy to welcome you tonight. My name is Nancy, I'm the director of the Holland Heritage Museum and we're just always excited to, to open the doors to you and to the programs that we do. I would like to take a moment to recognize that we are on native na land and to please think in honor of those who preceded us, including the people of the Duwamish, Snoqualmish, Nisqually, and the Mukashu tribes. We're always going to be doing this every single program. We want to make sure that it's not just a one-time deal, but it's something that's always living and organically uh, passing that message to everyone. So once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I'm going to um, have Debra come back and just introduce us to the program. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out to Seven Stories. We are coming along with this program, which is designed to just get people uh, to know other people in the community, build community, and hear the stories of people that you pass on the street, you see in the restaurants, you see at the library. So um, the deal is it's we try to get seven people, each telling a story of the length of seven minutes. And it has to be about that person, something that happened to that person, it has to be a true story, and they will be telling their stories to you. First tonight, we have our very own Sybil Davis, who is really the person who started this whole concept after uh, belonging to a similar group in Alaska where she lived. So um, she works very hard and uh, is really, we're getting this thing off the ground. So I would like to welcome Sybil. Okay, so uh, when I was a kid, I, by the time I was 12 years old, I lived in five different countries. And we were in Kaiserslautern, Germany in an army uh, base. And my father's job terminated. He had to join the army or leave, and he chose to leave. And he had two choices, Guam or Alaska. He chose Alaska, and so with five kids, mother and father, two French poodles, we came to Juneau, Alaska, when it was just becoming a state. It was very exciting, crazy. I had never lived in the United States before. There was a mountain over 3,000 feet high right across from my house, uh, Gastineau Channel in front, 40 miles of high road, and that was it. Um, but I was very happy because I knew I wasn't gonna have to move in two years. And in seventh grade, which is the end of seventh grade is where I st when I started, um, there were a number of attractive boys and I would write descriptors in my diary. And next to one, Kenny Daru, I wrote, doll, <laughs> intelligent. And we became friends. He was a chubby kid with glasses, and he was just genuine and nice and gentle. And as uh, time went on, he grew taller, grew a beard. We were friends all through high school, through the rest of our young adult adulthood. And we'd see each other often as we'd come back to Juno to work in the summertime. After many years of being far apart, I uh, ended up back in Juno, and I was at the Crystal Saloon and Ballroom uh -huh. on a weekend night, and in walks Ken Daru with his cowboy boots from San Francisco. Uh -huh. And he comes over to our table, and he sits down, and we start talking like old friends in a small town, which is what we were. And I said to Ken, um, gosh, if you ever go hiking, let me know, because I like to hike. So f he called me quite quickly, and we started hiking. It was a gorgeous summer, and Juneau, Alaska is a very, very picturesque, wild place, and we just went all over the place. Then he said, Sybil, how, you want to cross the Gaston, the, the Mendenhall Glacier? And I said, yeah, sure, that sounds exciting. Uh, yeah, I'm up for it. And so he got crampons for me, and he had them, and he had an ice axe, he got one for me. We he had a big rope that was a dirty rope, and he had been climbing in California, and so he was very experienced. Also, he was very steady and unflappable and trustworthy. So early in the morning, we set off to cross this mile and a half glacier, and it was uh, 
really intimidating at first, but then once you get out on it, you actually have quite a space between the deep crevasses. And I was roped to him, and I felt secure. Uh, good old Ken, Kenny Daru, he would he'd be steadfast, and he was. And uh, looking down in those deep crevasses of that real uh, azure, you know, uh, aqua blue was just gorgeous. We spent the night, camped out, went back the next day across the glacier, and just, it was a wonderful experience. About a week later, he got a call from a friend, uh, ex-teacher of his, good friend, who said, Ken, I've got a permit to go down the Colorado River. I've waited seven years. You can come and you can invite a friend. And Ken said, thought, we talked about it, and he said, I, you know, we got no money. And I said, man, what a, what a chance. So there we go. In September, uh, we're on the side of the Colorado River, and uh, it's three rafts, one kayak, 11 people, and a 30-day uh, permit down the river, and no guide. And I didn't know, know anybody but Ken. So, uh, but it's gorgeous there, and it's, you know, we're in for it. Um, we pack up, it takes about eight hours to pack up the raft, and you have to pack in and pack out everything, as you, as you know. Um, and uh, the first night, as we start going down late afternoon, we see mountain goats up on the crest, the top of the, the rim, and a heron flew off in the sky. <coughs> and it was gorgeous red, and the, it was just unbelievably spectacular. And we're heading down the Colorado River, and um, it's just thrilling. And then I hear what sounds like thunder, and I realize that's the sound of the rapid. And I had no idea. I'd never been on a river before. I had no idea what the rapids were going to be like. And, I, and then the reality crashed in on me. And so we, Ken and I are in the front holding it down, holding the ropes and holding down the bow of the raft and we head through the bubble line and we take it straight on and it's okay and we get all splashed and we're, we're bouncing around and it's just great fun. So that was the beginning of the 30 day trip. About, uh, I don't know, 13 days later, um, I decide, I, I think, you know, gosh, why don't the women take a raft for a change? Mm -hmm. And everybody thinks that's a great idea, all the women do. And so we take the raft for that day, and it's a nice uh, day, um, no problems, no big rafts, on, no big rapids on that day. <clears throat> and so we set off. And I'm following uh, one other raft. I was going to be in the middle on the rower and the uh, other raft behind me. But I got caught in an eddy, and so the third raft moved up to second place. And um, so, but I'm following them, I'm following them, uh, I'm lining up, I got, I got, I'm, I'm steady, you know, I've got the practice, and uh, <clears throat> so um, I see the guy in front, uh, the raft in front of me go over the pour over, up, up a huge wave, and uh, get kind of cockeyed, slip down, go up and, and then over. The only trouble is, David Sunshine, who was uh, reading Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception as he sat on the back of the raft, he, he was not there anymore. And I thought, holy crap, this is really a big pour over. But I'm lining up and I'm following him straight on and <clears throat> I go down, it's, it is, it's a big, big hole. And then up a big wave and we're getting over and I'm really trying to keep it straight, but we get cockeyed and we're, we're, I'm thrown out and we are flipped and I am under the raft and I'm in the cockpit oh. and I'm kind of freaking out I, and so I, I, I'm pushing to get out and I can't get out and something hits my head and I push again and I, get, I am freed and I get out and <clears throat> I'm just floating fast though and the, rap, the raft is behind me coming down on me and I'm just get, trying to get out of the way of this raft. It's pa I'm panicking. My feet are down, and which pulls me down. My life vest is popping up, and I'm pushing down and trying to get over. And I'm just swimming for all I'm worth and trying to get over. And Ken, he's got the lifeline, and he is throwing it, and he throws it to me, and it's a dead-on shot. And I can grab it. He pulls me over. We. I get out, we're saved, everybody else is safe. We have a big hug because it is so, it was so terrifying. 
and about that is when the brownies that we had that morning that were special <laughs> kicked in. <laughs> and uh, we had this big hug, and I think that's when he just, he felt like we should get married. And I thought, <laughs> you know, this is a guy I've, I've been roped to a couple times here. But we're a good team, and we're a good match. And uh, you've got to have both sides. And so in May, we'll celebrate 43 years of being married with two grown daughters and two grandchildren. The end. <laughs> Thank you, Sybil. That was great. I've been reading, uh, you know, on the internet about there's a uh, get married chicken recipe, you know, that something, some famous actress made it and their boyfriend proposed. Maybe we should rethink the brownie thing, you know, I mean, that seems to, <laughs> to work. So before I forget, I have these um, flyers for, uh, to t for you to take afterwards. It has the... Um, next to themes and the information. And so please come back, tell all your friends, and I'll have these later. So we now have Larry, who um, has, he says, my fascination with radio music and humor started when I was about six years old. And I'm not gonna tell the rest. Is that part of your story? Yeah. All right, well, I'm not gonna <laughs> reveal that then. So uh, Larry Yurden, please yes. come on up. Very good. I'm defining my when I was a kid story to go actually from the age of four to the age of 16. I've considered myself a kid all that time. Uh, starting in 1948, when I was four years old, we got the second TV on our block. My father was an inventor with a number of patents, fascinated with, fascinated with new devices. And... Uh, he got us a 10-inch RCA TV in 1948. And we were living in Far Rockaway, New York, and Long Island. Uh, and uh, turned on the TV. In the afternoon, there were test patterns. The first day, I sat and watched the test patterns. And then all the kids' shows started. There was Gabby Hayes. There was Pinky Lee. There was Howdy Doody, of course. There was uh, uh, all sorts of things. Mr. I Imagination, the man with the magic reputation. Watch Mr. Wizard, the merry mailman. All of these things were dear to my heart. Um, and uh, my, uh, in those days, before football was a really big thing, or at least professional football was, one of the big sports was boxing. And my father was a boxing fan. He would watch the Friday night fight sponsored by Gillette and every every few weeks he'd let me stay up and watch the fights with him on on TV. Uh, when I was about five and a half or so we moved to uh, my mother's hometown of Newark, New Jersey back uh, 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 across the way in, in Jersey and uh, uh, what I found, to my dismay, was that they had taught kids to read, taught, uh, to read a year earlier in New Jersey than they had in New York. So consequently, I was uh, unable to read, and everybody in the class could read. That's when, I guess, when I started to stutter a bit. I was intimidated. And uh, Christmas week, I spent the entire week with my mother she was teaching me to read. And when I got back to school, I was the best uh, reader in the class. And uh, uh, within a year, about six years old, I got myself a subscription to TV Guide, which was then like 15 cents a week or something like that. And I would read it basically from cover to cover. That was my uh, r reading primer. Um, and... Uh, we had a big shortwave radio in the dining room that I think had been a family, uh, I don't know, had been in the family. And uh, Peter Sellers had a, goon, uh, had a show called The Goon Show on the BBC. And we, our, in our shortwave radio, they broadcast it live on shortwave. And it was nine o'clock in London and four o'clock in New Jersey. 
and I would race home on Fridays to listen to Peter Sellers, Spike Milligan, and Harry Seacomb with The Goon Show. The uh, cast of uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus said that Monty Python never would have happened if it hadn't been for The Goon Show. And all of the Beatles movies wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for The Goon Show. It was that nutty sense of humor that uh, became British humor in a lot of ways. Uh, in 1954, my father bought an FM radio. FM was a rarity at that point, and the, most of the people who were doing FM were uh, doing it because they loved radio, not because they were trying to make money. And uh, there was amazing music I could hear nowhere else. I discovered folk music, jazz, blues, classical. But in the mid-50s, long before the folk revival, my passion was folk music. And uh, my parents, at the age of 11, let me take the bus downtown Newark from where we were in the Weequick section. Uh, and uh, that worked out OK. So. Uh, they had, uh, we'd visited uh, the village and I discovered this wonderful store called the Folklore Center, run by a great character named Izzy Young, who is mentioned in Bob Dylan's Chronicles extensively, by the way. He was a major influence on Dylan. But uh, uh, so I took the, uh, by the age of 12, I was taking the bus to the Port Authority bus terminal and taking the, 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 the subway down to, uh, uh, the Folklore Center in the in Greenwich Village. And uh, uh, Izzy gave me things like uh, uh, when Catcher on, in the Rye came out, he gave me a copy of Catcher in the Rye. He gave me Bob Dylan's first album. And uh, uh, I went, uh, and he had autograph parties for well-known folk singers. There was a woman named Jean Ritchie who played the Mountain Dulcimer and was from the singing Ritchie's of Viper, Kentucky, but she had married a New York photographer and lived in New York and was part of the whole folk scene. And here I was, this 12-year-old kid by myself showing up in 1954, 55, whatever it was, and uh, 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 55 or 56, and, and these people couldn't believe that there was this kid who showed up uh, to meet Gene Ritchie, but I did. Um, uh, and my stutter, really through the early years of high school, was, was pretty bad. But uh, I was given a tape recorder uh, by my parents. And when I was alone in the attic talking into the recorder, my stuttering stopped. And uh, this got me interested in doing radio. I realized that people were an abstraction. So, uh, uh, Later, when I was alone in the studio running my own controls, I wouldn't stutter n uh, no matter how many thousands of people were listening. Uh, so even as a teenager, I thought of myself as a student of popular culture. And in college, uh, later on, my self-styled major was technology and consciousness. How technology changes mass consciousness. Uh, and then various things made me more sensitive to the power of media. Somehow I got my picture in all the youth newspapers in the Soviet Union by being first in line opening day at the Russian exhibition at the New York Coliseum. Now I didn't, I didn't have any politics per se. I mean, uh, you know, I, I came from a, a New Deal Democratic family, but I was just uh, uh, intrigued. Uh, and wound up being the first person there and being uh, apparently in all the Russian used newspapers. Another uh, thing that happened was shaking hands with, with John F. Kennedy. A week before the presidential election, I went down by myself to the Mosque Theater in Newark, New Jersey. And uh, at the, at, after he left the stage, I just walked backstage and shook hands with him. And I was struck then how easy it was to approach him and worried that somebody might do him harm. Uh, so all of that culminated in my 25 years in radio uh, as a program director, music director, consultant, 
uh, uh, production coordinator for all of ABC's FM stations, various things like that. But this is, this is the bug that got me into it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think a lot of us wish we had had some of those experiences. Any other technology and consciousness majors out here? <laughs> no, he's the only one. All right, well. Okay, we will have Ron Hammond next. And um, let's see. Ron grew up in central Illinois, but has lived in Seattle most of his life. Uh, they moved to the Highline area four years ago. And the um, Highline Museum is one of his favorite places. And his book of photographs of the Pike Place Market is in the gift shop. So we can all exit through the gift shop. So <laughs> please welcome Ron Hammond. Yeah, thank you. I don't have a very strong voice. Um, one of my vocal cords decided to stop working, and our, our veterinarian daughter says that's a common malady among golden retrievers, and I'm not sure how, <laughs> I'm not sure what to make about that. But uh, I grew up in a small town, farm town, in central Illinois in the 1940s. The summers there were long and hot, you can bet on that, and really boring. The weekly event, the only event actually, was the Tuesday evening band concert on the courthouse lawn. That's not setting the bar very high. As a consequence, it wasn't real hard to get together a crowd of the town kids if there was anything going on that, um, that looked interesting. And we had a fairly efficient uh, kid uh, grapevine to get the word out so, uh, so that everybody would know about it. On Tuesday, they're going to be blowing stumps on the field next to the high school. Blowing stumps. This town, like a lot of them, was heavily forested with beautiful old hardwood trees, elms and oaks and maples and uh, uh, horse chestnuts and walnuts. But about a decade before that, the elm blight had killed all the elm trees all over the all over essentially all over the United States. The American elm is essentially extinct. And by the time I was aware of things going on, the, the village was dotted with elm stumps. Stumps this you know this big around and sticking up a couple of feet out of the ground from the from the elm trees. Well, after World War II, there was a, a, a rush for building in the Midwest. But every time, every place that you wanted to build something, there was a couple of elm stumps in your way. Now, elms have deep roots, and they get a really good grip on the earth, and the wood is as hard as a rock. So the only practical way to deal with getting those stumps out of the way was with dynamite. A crowd pleaser for the little kids. <laughs> the note says, oh, um, there were two, actually, there were two, two people that did stump removal, uh, two jack-of-all-trades. One of them was very methodical. He would walk carefully around the stump, f figuring out where the main roots were, getting, uh, getting well established as to where it needed to be. But he would dig a, a very carefully dig a cavity underneath the, st the stump, put in a small amount of dynamite, maybe a quarter of a stick, maybe not quite that much, add a blasting cap, add a long fuse, light the fuse and walk away from it. And a few seconds later, there would be this kind of polite harumph, and the stump would jump about a foot and a half up at the ground, enough that you could see daylight under it. And he'd come along with a steel cable and run it under the stump and back over, and pull it out of the, uh, out of the hole with the winch that was on the back of his Jeep. Well, the field down by the high school didn't have a couple of elm stumps. It had about 25 of them. So that looked like it was going to be a day of entertainment for the, uh, for the local kids. <laughs> on, the on the appropriate Tuesday, there was a string of bicycles a block long in front, of the, uh, in front of the high school. And a crowd of maybe 40 middle school, junior high age kids on the slope that went from the street down into the field. And they weren't all boys, by the way. That probably, that probably constituted most of the town kids of that age in, this, in the school. Waiting to see who was going to turn up. 
Well, it wasn't Katie Swan and his Army surplus Jeep. It was a rattletrap pickup truck piloted by a guy in a black and white striped locomotive engineer's cap. The day had suddenly taken a good turn. The, the, the word went back and forth along the crew of kids. It's Shorty. Shorty Kirshner. He was short. He was about 5'6", uh, sturdy build, heavily muscled, impossibly strong. I, it just, he was incredibly strong. Carefree kind of smiling guy, mischievous. His approach for blowing stumps was a little more direct. With, with no examination or, or thought, he would go. He would walk up to the stump and poke a hole under it with, a, with an iron rod, sort of like a crowbar, and put in a whole stick of dynamite, and add a blasting cap, and a short fuse, and light the fuse, and then he'd run like mad and dive behind another stump or maybe just drop to the ground, and then there would be this window rattling kaboom setting all of the, bringing the stump almost out of the ground, throwing dirt and rocks and bits of stump everywhere, setting all the neighborhood dogs into hysterics, convincing every crow on that side of town that they had urgent business somewhere else. In the shuddering silence that followed, you could smell the dynamite, you could hear the cawing of the crows outbound in all directions, accompanied by the hysterical barking of the neighborhood dogs. It was wonderful. <laughs> we all cheered and applauded and, and Shorty tipped his cap and, uh, and grinned at us. Well, very shortly thereafter, more bicycles started arriving with kids pedaling furiously and lamenting the fact that they were missing the fun. And a fair number of mothers were turning up to try to drag their kid home before they got involved in the explosives too much. You know, it was, oh, Mom, I, I want to stay and watch. I'll stay back on the other side of the street until you go away again. And that was the way the morning went. Periodic explosions, just enough, just enough time between them that the neighborhood dogs would kind of retain, kind of get back into a, a semblance of sanity. And when Shorty got ready to go for lunch, we all did too. But the... Um, audience, most of the audience uh, reassembled after lunch for the matinee, which kept on until the last stump was out of the ground late afternoon sometime. How good can it be for a bunch of small town kids? Or, you know, all your friends were in one place at one time. Explosions, bad smells, dogs <laughs> barking. How, you know, it was, it was, it was a, a, day to, a day to remember. So when Shorty was all done, he packed up his stuff, and we all trailed off to, first of all, to shower and get this, the dirt and the dynamite smell out and the sweat out of our hair and get something to eat because it was still Tuesday and the band concert was going to be, begin at dusk time. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. That was great. I grew up in a small, boring town in Connecticut. We had the concert. We didn't have the stumps and the dynamite. I had no idea what I was missing until now. Uh, next, we have Peggy Cummings. Um, I know Peggy just from a walking group I'm in, and I know she does a lot of outdoor stuff. I know she lived in West Seattle. I know she lived, grew up in eastern Washington, and I know she's going to tell us a great story. So please welcome Peggy Cummings. One slight correction. I really almost always grew up in Seattle. I moved here when I was 15. But I was in eastern Washington and Spokane at the very beginning. And you know, beginnings do shape you. So my story is... Just a minute. Can everybody hear that? You could maybe a full more. Yeah. Yeah. How is this? Is this better? Yes. I don't want to kiss this. There's no sani wipes. So, <laughs> hello. So, it's better to beg forgiveness than to ask permission. And that was a lesson I learned when I was quite young. My family of three had moved to Kennewick, Washington after World War II. There was a new development next to an older neighborhood where there were all these little cracker box houses on windy roads because there were no big through streets. And there were a lot of children there. 
And so it was a really safe area to grow up. It was not Leave it to Beaver yet, but it was safe and fun. And the main entry road from downtown was just a block or so away. And it was a typical, I mean, we're talking 1951, 100 years ago. So it was a kind of just a regular road with a wide shoulder. And the thing about it was that the shoulder was wide enough that it was safe to walk on. And we also used to go out and pick wild asparagus in the shoulder area every summer. And summers were pretty fun because no school, all of the kids are out playing. We played in the streets, no cars, whatever. And, but the big treat of the day, or the week actually, was when the ice cream man came. And once a week, this guy in this funky little truck would come around selling ice cream. And believe me, even, even back in the 50s, it was really hot in Kennewick in the summer. So my little friend and I were out there waiting for him to come. We each had a dime. And for some reason, that day, he was a no-show. Well, we were, had our hearts set on ice cream. And I'm about six, and I think she was a little younger than me. So I said, oh, well, that's OK. We can just walk down the road to Sherman's Grocery. They make their own ice cream there. It'll be fun. And she kind of looked at me, well, oh, do you think it's OK? I said, sure, let's go. So the two of us in our little, oops, little dresses, we start walking down the shoulder of the road to go get ice cream, not realizing that a mile is a bit of a trudge for two little girls. So, but we're careful, because I had been taught always face the oncoming traffic so you know what's coming at you. So we're walking along, and all of a sudden this car comes towards us. No big deal, except the car slowed down. And I'm going, uh-oh. My mother said, don't ever let a stranger talk to you. Don't go anywhere with a stranger. And watch out for people in cars who drive by you. So we pulled back to the edge of the road. And this car comes along and right up next to us. The window rolls down. And you know, when you're only six and you're this tall and the window's up here, it's kind of hard to see. But pretty soon, this guy sticks his head out and says, what are you two doing here? And I was pretty nervous, but then I realized he was actually the father of another of the kids in the neighborhood. And I said, oh, well, we're walking down to Sherman's to get our ice cream. No, you're not. You're going to get in the car, and I'm taking you back home because you are not walking to Sherman's for ice cream. Well, since we knew him, we got in the car, and he deposited my little friend at her house, took me over to my mom's house. My little friend was seriously scolded and received a spanking as discipline for taking off and doing something naughty. And I was deposited with my mom, who was really upset with me. She said, where have you been? I've been so worried about you. And I said, well, we were going to go get ice cream. And she said, well, why didn't you ask me if you could do that? Would you have said yes? And she said, well, no, I wouldn't have. And I said, well, that's why I didn't ask. I didn't want you to tell me no. <laughs> I had this figured out at a young age. <laughs> and so she proceeded to explain to me what was wrong with my philosophy right there, even though I didn't know it was a philosophy when I was six, that she had been so worried and so anxious about what had happened to me, because literally I'm out you know, in the yard waiting for the ice cream truck and then we're all gone and we can't be seen anywhere. So I got a lesson on what it means to take off without understanding that there are consequences and so sometimes asking permission is okay. Begging forgiveness can be kind of hard when you have to explain what you did to somebody whose feelings you have hurt and that you have really frightened because she is so worried about what had happened or might have happened to her child. And so I didn't get a spanking. But I felt worse, I think, than I would have if I had because I now realized how my actions had really, really hurt my mother that much. And so the lesson was, yes, I still, for my entire life, beg forgiveness rather than asking permission 
if you are a woman and you always ask permission, you will never get anything done. But I also understood that I needed to understand the consequences of my actions, particularly on the people that were dear to me and that I loved, uh, and even strangers sometimes. So that was my story in wonderful Tri-Cities, Kennewick, Washington. <laughs> Thank you, Peggy. My inner child can really remembers back to that ice cream, you know, and if the guy didn't show up, I applaud you for just, you go to the store. I mean, you start walking down the street. As a mother, I think, so, yeah. Okay, next we have Loretta Johnson. Loretta is from Normandy Park, right? And you are a writer, is that right? Yes. So, um, Let's see, she's written two books, Farm Stories and Bridge of Demarcation. And um, I want to call her up to hear her story. I love adventures. When I first read the history of my ancestors, I realized that was why I had a sense of adventure as part of my DNA. Both sets of grandparents traveled from Czechoslovakia to Chicago one set was teenagers. They settled in Chicago not knowing each other. One had been trained as a cabinet maker and one had been trained as a baker. But all of a sudden, they started dreaming about farming. They rushed when the West was opened up and they were to receive free land. So children in tow, they moved to central Montana. My parents were both born and raised in this area, not aware that farming was so difficult because of the harsh winters, the hot and dry summers, the untold graces of a hailstorm, grasshopper plagues, and mosquitoes. I was born in 1947 and joined my two older sisters on the farm. We had no electricity, no running water, and no in, uh, telephone. But our place made up for a lot of other things. We had chickens, one rooster, two milking cows, dogs, a wild cat, and a famous outhouse. <laughs> we had it, one of the cows name was, Holst, was Nellie, this was the Holstein, and the other cow, who was a Jersey cow, his name was Jersey. And then one of our dogs name was Puppy, so you can see how creative we were with <laughs> naming things. We always had a lot of fun but we only made up our own entertainment. In the summertime, it was great sitting out in the outhouse looking at the Sears Roebuck or the Montgomery Ward's catalogs, but we were very thankful when my mother would buy peaches and we would have the soft pink tissues that the peaches were wrapped in. We would often go to visit my grandparents who were living nearby and we were excited to be in their house, even though it was only a two-room house. My grandmother always would have pancakes with sh uh, rolled with in sugar and cinnamon, waiting in the cupboard. We would go out and pick dandelions and help them make dandelion wine. One day, when we were leaving there, my mother was always a fast driver, and she was hurrying to get home, driving on a gravel road. I decided that my back door wasn't closed good. So I opened the door and hung on, dragging along, getting scraped knees, losing my sock and shoe. I decided that was enough of that adventure for a three-year-old. I think that was when they decided that they needed to add children's safety locks to the rear doors of cars. <laughs> my... Uh, to make sure that I get all this stuff. Some of the farm activities uh, would be that in the summertime, my 
mother would drive truck for my dad for two weeks during harvest. This meant that my two older sisters and I would run the farmhouse. My sister, who was nine, could drive the car. My other sister, who was eight, could make and bake pies and cake. We would oftentimes have to make a full dinner, meaning mashed potatoes, gravy, meat, vegetables, salad, and drive it to the field to my parents at noon. In the afternoon, we would drive the hot coffee and the warm pie to them. My main job was just holding the lids in the back seat on the kettles. But I did have a, an important job with my oldest sister is to learn how to milk the cows and help her with that. We would oftentimes uh, entertain ourselves because we could go and uh, when we pick the eggs from the chicken coop, we would be bored and so we'd play catch for a little while <laughs> getting to the house. But once we dropped two eggs, then we hurried up and didn't play that game anymore. We also had one record, and so in, in 1952, we actually got uh, electricity and running water and said goodbye to the outhouse. And we had one record, Blueberry Hill by Fats Domino. We learned to sing and dance to it a lot. We also had uh, a radio where we would listen to The Lone Ranger and Tonto. And of course, my sisters got the idea that they would, that I was the Indian, and they would tie my feet together and tie my hands behind my back. Well, I fell on my nose, and my mother said, that's enough of that. You're going to go do some chores. So we always had chores to do. But soon, when I was five years old, I was able to join my two sisters at our one-room country schoolhouse. I was only five years old, and there was a boy who was the second grader, and he was the teacher's son. And then I had one classmate, Susan. And I decided that the, at that time that there was a teacherage attached to the schoolhouse, and our teacher and her two sons lived there. And we still, she still would use the outhouse, and. Um, we had this one small room called the cloak room, and I decided that that should be the house where Michael and Susan and I should play house. So we would save bits of our lunch, and I would obviously have to serve dinner to my husband and our child. Well then, mostly husbands and wives also kiss, so we did some kissing. Well, my older sisters, they snuck up on us and opened the door after a few weeks, and they were jealous that I was having a boyfriend to kiss. So they told, oh my gosh, I gotta get going here. <laughs> they told my parents, and reluctantly I quit. We also, uh, during the uh, harvest, or we also discovered uh, when we would be running the household during harvest is that we could um, drive around the house a couple times and park the car in the shade behind the house. Well, after a few turns around, we came up with the idea that we could have a drive-in restaurant. Mind you, this was before McDonald's had theirs. So we would take the screen off of the kitchen door window, or kitchen window, and my sister, the baker, would stay inside and would serve the homemade root beer floats, we made our own root beer, and some of her pastries. She would put them on a cookie sheet and pass them out the window to my oldest sister driving the car and myself. We didn't patent the idea though, so otherwise we'd have been rich. Uh, we moved to Big Sandy, although it wasn't a big, uh, when I was in the fifth grade. I didn't know anyone, so I sat in the second row near the teacher. Well. I didn't realize that the rows would file out accordingly. So the second day was my day, to, my row was to file out. Well, consequently, I didn't realize that all the boys that were in front of me would be going into the boys' bathroom. I walked in and they all started screaming. 
But we never had that problem when we would use the outhouse in the country because obviously uh, I didn't realize that you would stand in line or you'd all go to the bathroom at the same time. When I uh, got older, I thought as an eighth grader, even though I didn't have a driver's license, I should be able to drive around town. One Sunday, all of my family was gone and my friend had come over to visit. So we started to back the pickup out of the, house, uh, the garage and then it was time to head home before my parents got home. Well, I started to scrape the passenger door on the side of the garage and immediately I thought, I've got to get out and have somebody else drive. Well, my friend decided she would try it, but she made it worse. So we noticed this boy across the street and we called him. Well, he got it in the garage, but I needed to repair the garage door. So I found some sandpaper, sanded down the rough wood, but there was no white paint. So the next best thing was to get the white shoe polish and use the dabber to uh, whiten the, the wood on the door. Well, everything was cool until the next day, the, the scratch was still on the side of the pickup. Well, my older sister got blamed for it. And then they looked at me and I said, well, I don't even have a driver's license. How could it be me? <laughs> But even though I got a driver's license, I still had driving adventures. If there was nothing else going around in, in Big Sandy, we would drive 30 uh, miles to Haver, sometimes just to get a Coke or a hamburger. Well, my friend and I, we took off one night at about 11 o'clock at night, and we headed to Haver, and all of a sudden this carload of teenagers are chasing us and hollering. Well, good thing I was a fast driver and gunned the pickup out of town quickly. Well, the next Saturday, my sister was home from college and she said to my mother, well, I could have swore that I saw Loretta driving around in daddy's pickup on Saturday night. And I said, how could that have been? You know Robertson's car was parked in the driveway behind where the pickup was and it didn't have, daddy had said there was no gas in it. So those adventures were later told, but not today. <laughs> Thank you. Our final storyteller is Josh Gerstman. Let's see. Grew up in Massachusetts. Hey, Connecticut, New Englander. Uh, lived in a nice house in the end of a cul-de-sac. Uh, I'm not going to read all this, but he answers a question that I've always wondered. You know, you wonder where an expression or a word came from. Well, we're going to find out. So please welcome Josh Gerson. Well, when I was young, we, the woods behind my house was a source of endless adventures. I was the youngest of three. I had two older sisters. And inside the house, they got to pick what TV shows we watched, what snacks we ate, and what games we played. And not that their decisions were bad. They just weren't mine. So when I could go out into the woods and explore, it was freedom to me. Now those woods started at our, behind our house and they ran the entire length of our street, Huntington Street. They were a buffer between Huntington and Liberty Street. So there were our houses and the Liberty Street houses behind us. And then on the north side, they ran into a chain link fence. And that chain link fence ran from the northwest side across the street behind the neighbor's house and ran the entire the length of Huntington Street on the opposite side. On the other side of that chain link fence was the swamp. So really the only thing that separated those woods from the swamp was this little chain link fence. Now Natick, Massachusetts was the ancestral homes of the Natick Indians and Algonquin tribes. In the Algonquin language, the word for swamp is podunk. And one of the interpretations of Natick is a settlement or searching for high places. So the smart people in Natick lived up on the hills away from the swamp where the water wouldn't get you. But the developer who built our street decided to just put up a chain link fence and build our neighborhood basically in Podunk. <laughs> now, it really didn't bother me that I was living in Podunk because I'd go into those woods with my five imaginary brothers who at any given time were a band of cowboys, the crew of a pirate ship, the um, team on a, of paleontologists, 
or a group of astronauts on one of those early spacecraft. I'm older than I look. <laughs> and we would explore those woods for arrowheads, dinosaur bones, sunken treasure, and enough of the um, spare parts for a space, space, spacecraft to get us back off the ground. When I was about four years old, my dad built me my first fort. It was actually just a side deck off of our big deck, but it had a trap door and a rope ladder. And I'd climb that rope ladder up through the hatch, and I would stand there as if I was on the bow of my ship and looking out into the woods, and I'd see two trees that were crossed like this. And I think, that's the spot. I don't know what the spot was, but that was it. <laughs> so I had a lot of adventures in those woods. It was a magical place for me. And in addition to my five imaginary brothers, a lot of other things could be found there. When I was born, my family had a dog named Kelly. He was a German shepherd. And he died when I was about three, and he was about 13. And my family was so upset. But I came in and I said, I don't know why you're all crying. Every time I go out into the woods, Kelly's there. And my brothers are taking good care of him. That's how special those woods were. Also, you could get into the swamp behind the chain link fence, and there was a really large boulder. I mean, this boulder must have been almost as big as, not quite Mount Rainier, but <laughs> it was large in a four-year-old's eye. And so I would try to climb that, and I would try to chip away at it, make my own arrowheads, all sorts of things. And the other thing about that swamp is in the wintertime, it froze. And you would go out and test the ice. The sisters would send the brother out to test the ice. And if it was solid enough, you could walk on it and then eventually skate on it and skate all the way out to Pickerel Pond, where there was usually a group of boys playing pond hockey. And sometimes they let you be the goal. Not the goalie, the goal. <laughs> so those are some magical times. And when I started to get a little older, I was eight years old, I saw these three boys riding bikes up and down the street and up and down the street. And they were those huffy bikes with the um, rectangular seat and the knobby tires. And I, for some reason, was never allowed to have a bike like that because my dad thought that I would do something dangerous with it. So I was really envious of those until Brian, the oldest of the boys, said, hey, you want to give it a try? And the first thing I did is I rode it as fast as I could across the street, hit the curb, and ended up flat on my back. But that's another story. Those boys quickly started to replace my imaginary brothers because they were real brothers, Brian, Jeff, and Pete. And their house was on the corner, and we could walk the woods from house to house with about six other houses in between. One day, we found a big piece of plywood leaning up against the shed in our backyard. And we thought, this is great. We didn't think to ask permission, and we didn't even think to like come up with a good design, but we dragged that piece of wood right out to where those two trees crossed like this. And we built a lean-to. I wouldn't so much say built at this point, but we thought we had a great hiding place for our neighborhood games of hide and seek, as well as um, hiding from my sisters who were appearing from their house. But then, when we heard this barking behind us, we realized that the Liberty Street houses could see right into our lean-to because there was nothing on the other side. So we took that piece of plywood and we brought it over the cross piece of those trees to support it. And we took all the other scrap wood we could find over by my dad's wood pile and we started to build a fort. Once again, we didn't think to ask permission. In order to build a fort, you needed nails and screws and you needed tools like a hammer and a saw. So we just kept going in the garage and grabbing those and bringing them out. Well, we thought we did a pretty good job, and we even cut a hatch on the top of that piece of plywood so that we could pop in and out of there. Well, we forgot to put all those tools away, the hammers, the saws. We thought, we'll get to it later. Well, the next day, my dad was screaming, where's my saw? Where's my hammer? My sister remembered seeing us out there doing something, so she ran out to get them. What she didn't know is there was a bunch of nails and she stepped on those. So when the parents got back from the hospital where she had to get a tetanus shot, I got a nice little talking to. But fortunately, we were able to keep the fort. And uh, we used to keep all sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, one item of note is one time Brian opened up the World Book Encyclopedia and found an article about gunpowder. And he said, hey, Gunpowder is made with uh, potassium nitrate. If I got that right, that's also what's in the tip of matches. 
So we went around the house and we collected all the matchbooks and we scraped all the match heads into this little cup and we were gonna create gunpowder. And um, for a long time, that fort smelled a lot like sulfur. And that also caused another uh, brief moment of healthiness in our family because my dad couldn't find any matches to light his cigarettes that evening. <laughs> well, we got older and we went to middle school and high school and sports and band practice and cars and girls. We started to forget about that fort. But one day when I was in high school, I was hearing them some laughter and I looked out the window and our neighbors were having a party and some little kids had run out into the woods and they'd found our fort. And for a moment, I was really happy. I thought, this is cool. Somebody thinks what we did was really cool. And then one of those boys comes running out of the woods with an arrow saying, look what I found. And I quickly remembered some of the other things that we had left in that fort. And I said, today's the day. And I ran out there and I started taking that fort apart and made sure I had some big garbage bags to put some of that stuff so nobody else could see what a 12 or 13 year old boy might think to hide in a fort. So I went off to college and didn't really think much about it, but there was always a piece of the woods that stayed magical with me. Well, in the mid nineties, I moved out here to Western Washington and I was volunteering and I met this woman and she was telling me about these hikes that she would go on and pretty soon she invited me along. And we went to Cougar Mountain and Tiger Mountain and Denny Creek and all sorts of places along the um, Cascades. And pretty soon I had discovered two things. One, I had fallen in love with the woman, Heather, she's right back there. And I'd rediscovered the magic of the woods. So much so that when we got married with our first dog, we became volunteers with King County Search and Rescue and King County Search Dogs. We've been doing that for almost 25 years. The other thing that happens when you get married sometimes, sometimes, is you have a child. We had a son. When my son was young, I helped him build his first fort in our backyard, mm -hmm. off of the back of our shed. And just to the south of there is a set of woods that we share with the neighbor. And we had a wood pile. And I said, you, Jacob, you can use any of this wood you want. I just ask that you put things away when you're done. <laughs> well, as it's happened more than one time, I've had to go out to the wood pile to find my hammer, my drill, and my saw. <laughs> and so the one thing that I look forward to is maybe someday Jacob has a child and we get to help them build a fort, and he has to go find his tools out in the woods. <laughs> Thank you very much. What is it about a fort? I mean, I just remember all of us wanted a fort, even if it was a card table with a blanket on it. It was, there's something really iconic and magical about a fort. So. Thank you, everybody. I think we had, I'm really excited that we had such a great group of storytellers tonight. Hope you will come back. You don't have to tell a story and never show up again. We welcome having you come back and tell another story. So um, thank you for such a wonderful, entertaining, and meaningful evening, all of you. Good night.